retain task work. This is the third presentation as a part of our three uh, part series on college admissions and planning for seniors and their families. And so I know I've seen a lot of you at all of our presentations this fall. It's been really nice to be working with you and your students on this process. It can be very overwhelming, but also very exciting. Um, and so we think you're gonna get a lot out of tonight, which is how to pay for all of this wonderful excitement. Um, it can be a little overwhelming and a little stressful, uh, but you are in very, very good hands with Michael Ellison. He is the representative from MIFA, uh, that is, stands for the Massachusetts Education Financing Authority, and they are a wonderful resource um, about financial aid. They have a website that has a great deal of information, so you're welcome to go to MIFA.org at any time and get connected to some assistance throughout this process. Um, Michael and I have been doing this a fair amount of years now. I think this is like year five that Michael's been our representative from MIFA. He is the Associate Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at Amherst College, which is an outstanding school um, in Massachusetts and in the nation. It's one of the top schools. And you're in very, very good hands with Michael tonight. Um, so without further ado, before I turn it over to him, I just want to make sure that everyone has the resources that were available in the back on the table. So you should have three different things with you today. You should have the PowerPoint slides uh, with room to take notes. You should also have the Understanding Financial Aid Flyer brochure provided by MIFA with a lot of really good information and some great links. <laughs> And then the last piece is the College Financing Seminar Evaluation Form. And this is where you're going to rate MIFA and rate Michael and make sure that we um, are all kind of giving you the information that you're looking for and that you need. Um, MIFA does really take these evaluations very seriously and they always are working to improve their services. So thank you for in advance for filling one of these out. So hopefully now everybody has all the things that they need and we will turn it over to Mr. Michael Ellison. Let's give him a warm fantastic welcome. Thank you everyone. And thank you so much for being here tonight. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Um, for just a show of hands really quickly, how many uh, folks, this is their first child going to college? Yay, okay, good. Good for you for all being here and getting some of this information. It's a big process. Uh, the financial aid process, but it's, it's easier to um, split it up into digestible small amounts. So the more that you can arm yourself with this information, which is quite specific, the terminology, um, the way that we determine eligibility, all of these things is, is quite specific. So the more information that you can arm yourself with, especially if this is your first student going through the process, absolutely the better. So as I said, uh, as uh, Ms. Cantrell uh, said, I'm uh, Michael Ellison, I'm uh, Associate Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Amherst College. I'm in my 21st year at the college. Uh, prior to that, I was at the University of Massachusetts down in Dartmouth. I was there for a, a couple of years and I started my career in higher education at the University of Washington out in Seattle after I graduated from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So it's nice to be here. It's nice to be back in the area. Um, so I've got some information. As we go through, uh, I'll have just about an hour worth of stuff. I might go a little bit quicker than that. As it says on the screen, um, you can always grab the slides. If you didn't get the handout, you can always go to MIFA slash events and get a printout of the slides that we're talking about here tonight. Um, if you have a clarifying question as we're going through a specific area, uh, go ahead and put your hands up and, and I'll be happy to answer your question as we're going along. If it's, like again, more of a clarifying question, at the end I'll, I'll leave time for more public questions that everybody wants to hear. And then if your question is a little more personal in nature and you really don't want to share it with the whole group, I'd be happy to spend a little couple of minutes over here on the side after we're done so you can ask you a more personal question. So without further ado, let us go. So NEPA is a not-for-profit as a state agency created in 82, 1982, to help families to be able to plan and save and pay for college and each of their financial goals. So it's a great resource to have. MIFA.org is a great website that gives you a lot of information. You can call them, you can email them, you can follow them on social media. Um, you can attend the seminar like you're doing now. You could also get uh, a, a, the webinar. You can attend the webinar as well. One thing I forgot, if everybody would be so kind as to make phones quiet, as I will do myself. Great, thank you. So tonight, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about the types and sources of financial aid, we're going to review the financial aid application process, we're going to understand how financial aid decisions are made, we're going to learn about paying for college, and we're going to talk about some free resources that are available to you as well. Firstly, the types and sources of financial aid. 
generally speaking, you've got these three types of financial aid that are available to students. So you've got grants and scholarship, also referred to as gift aid, our favorite type of aid. That goes directly to reduce down the uh, institutional charges that you'll be paying, so it never has to be repaid. Federal work study is also another type of financial aid that usually represents the student's opportunity to work during the academic year, earn a little bit of pocket money just so they're not hitting up mom and dad for every single penny of their spending money. It's really typically intended to offset the personal expenses that are included in their student expense budget. And then most schools, the vast majority of schools, will include student, student loans as part of their uh, financial aid packages. So it's really important to be conversant and knowledgeable about the different types of loans that are available. And quickly, I'll just say, uh, we're going to get into more detail about this in a second, but you always want to maximize your federal student loan eligibility uh, before going on to any of the private types of lending that are available out there. So the big picture, financial aid breakdown. Uh, last year, in 1718, there were about $184 billion of total financial aid that was administered in the, in the U.S. Um, throughout the, all the different colleges that are out there. This comes from the, the College Board's Trends in Student Aid of 2018. So out of that 184 billion, about 30% of that was student loans. So that's why it's so important to be knowledgeable about student loans. The vast majority of schools are going to include student loans as part of their financial aid awards. And so you and your student want to be make sure, you both want to make sure that you're very clear as to what you're getting yourselves into uh, in terms of signing on for student loans. Uh, institutional grants and scholarships, particularly schools that have more resources than others, uh, usually have a lot more of their institutional grants and scholarships that are part of the financial aid picture. There's also federal grants in the form of Pell Grants and the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, the SEOG. Those make up about 15%. Uh, private grants make up about 7%. So those would be sort of the outside scholarships that your students have the opportunity to apply for. And then federal tax credits make up about 8%. When those were enacted back in the 90s, they were never supposed to be considered part of financial aid, but you can see now that they are. There's veteran benefits, state grants that are available as well. And federal work study makes up about 1% of all of that $184 billion. So when you're looking at aid, you don't want to, um, you want to make sure that you're resourcing, you're researching all the different sources of aid that are out there. So there's federal aid that's available, and by doing the free application for federal aid, you're putting yourself in for all these types of federal grants. Again, that would include things like the Pell Grant and the SEOG I just referenced. Federal work study, uh, federal student loans, tax incentives. Details on all the federal types of aid are out there at the studentaid.gov website. The state of Massachusetts also has substantial amounts of aid that they uh, administer as well in the form of uh, the Mass Grant. There's also now a part-time Mass Grant for those students that are attending community college as a, on a part-time basis. There's a number of scholarships that are available there as well. Um, there's tuition waivers depending upon where you've graduated in your high school class or if your uh, parents work for the state, there may be tuition waivers there. And then there's state loans that are available as well. The most advantageous type of state loan that's out there is called the no interest loan. Just like it sounds, it has a 0% interest rate, so it's very advantageous. Not every school in the state is allocated uh, money towards a no interest loan, but if you're offered that, take advantage of that. It's absolutely the best form of borrowing that you can do in terms of educational loans. And more details can be found at mass.edu uh, mass slash OSFA, Office of Student Financial Aid is what that stands for. Obviously, lots of colleges and universities provide tons of their own institutional funding in the form of grants and scholarships. Um, many times when we do a calculation, if we've determined that it's more advantageous for the family, for us to have a calculated family contribution that's less than the federal calculation, we'll have to forego any federal aid because we're below their calculation. But so many, sometimes uh, institutional aid will consist of uh, grants and scholarships, institutional work, as well as institutional loans in, that, in those cases. And then other agencies. You want to make sure that you're taking advantage of the different scholarships that are out there. One financial aid office website that I would bring to your attention is FinAid, like financial aid, F-I-N-A-I-D dot O-R-G. That's a really good general financial aid resource that I would definitely bring to your attention. They have a whole section about scholarship scams that you want to avoid. They also link out to free scholarship search services uh, I believe FastWeb is one of them. The MIFA pathway is also a very good opportunity to learn about scholarship opportunities in your area. And I would also bring uh, Ms. Nicole up to, to speak a moment about local opportunities that are available. Hi, 
name is Nicole Papazian. Welcome everyone. I'm one of the school counselors here at Tentasqua. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about local scholarships. So there's about 80 local scholarships that students could be eligible for in the district. Um, we have a presentation in early February about these scholarships, so information is shared about the application process at that time. Um, and February break in the middle of the month is a good time where students can be working on their scholarship applications to be applying to be eligible for those. Um, March is a window where it is open submission time, so students could be applying um, in early March to be considered for the scholarships. And the scholarships are awarded and identified in May, so they'll be awarded at our um, senior award night to be considered for those. If, if students are having, or parents are having any questions about the scholarship process, feel free to reach out to the student's guidance counselor, or Ms. Kentrell is the director of guidance and should be happy as well to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, so you don't want to overlook any of the different resources that are available in terms of financial aid. By doing the FAFSA form, that free application for federal student aid, you are putting yourself in for all the federal aid as well as all the state aid as long as you meet the application deadline for the state, which I believe is March 1st. Okay, as I said, most, the vast majority of schools will include student loans as part of their financial aid awards. So it's important to know the details about the, the borrowing options that are available to students. So the federal direct student loans are one option that are available. Um, this is where the student is the sole borrower, so the parents are not part of this in terms of being the legally responsible party to repay the loan. It's not based on a credit check. Um, they were both subsidized and unsubsidized student loans. Those loan limits in the upper right represent the combination of the maximum subsidized and unsubsidized student loans. So basically you'd want to take $2,000 off of each of these numbers to, to represent the maximum subsidized student loan. Subsidized loans mean that the interest is paid by the federal government while the student's enrolled in school, including six months after graduation, and if they go on to graduate or professional school during that time as well. There's a form that has to be submitted that the registrar at the graduate level will indicate that the student is in fact enrolled, and then that will put them back into deferment. Uh, unsubsidized loans are accruing interest from the, times, from the time that the uh, funds are dispersed, but they're not, you're not required to make any payments during the student's enrollment, but the interest is occurring, so it's important to keep that in mind. For the current 1920 school year, the interest rate is 4.529%. That's a fixed interest rate. That gets re-indexed each June 30th for the coming academic year. So if your student were enrolled at this time during this academic year and they borrowed a loan, it would be at that 4.529. When they go to borrow a loan in the subsequent year, it might be at a different interest rate because it gets re-indexed each year. But the 4.529, if they borrowed this year, would stay as a fixed rate throughout the entire time the life of that loan. In terms of repayment, as I mentioned, there's no payments required while the student's enrolled. There are a lot of options. Many of them are tied to income. Some of them are called the income-based repayment. So if your student gets out of college and they've got some student loan debt and they're uh, finding themselves in a relatively modest paying job, um, it would be behoove them to uh, take advantage of the income-based repayments because it could very well be that based on the calculations, no payments are required during this time of relative modest income. Um, now, if you borrow the maximums, again on that top right, each year you would come up to $27,000. That's nothing to sneeze at. And as your student is going along through school, you don't want them to just come into the financial aid office and go, yeah, 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 where do I sign and let me get out of here. More importantly, what you want to make sure is each time that they're taking on a new portion of the loan, you want to make sure that they know, okay, that means that you've now totally borrowed X dollars and what that means in terms of a monthly uh, repayment once you graduate. If you did borrow the full $27,000, that's about $300 a month for 10 years. So it's important to pay attention to your indebtedness as you're going along. It really makes a big difference. It might make a difference whether you're able to buy a car after graduation or start a family or buy a home, any of these things. So it's really important to pay attention, close attention to how much you borrowed instead of just kind of blindly signing, as we say. There are deferment, forbearance, and different forgiveness opportunities depending upon the type of loan, the type of work that you're doing after graduation. Deferment means that there's no interest or uh, payments required. Forbearance typically means that the interest is still accruing and that you're, you may be making payments only on the interest. And forgiveness opportunities, again, are, are depending upon um, different careers that the student goes into, maybe teaching, uh, law, so law enforcement, public service, those types of things. Okay, so we've got basically two different types of financial aid on the big national landscape. You've got merit-based aid and you've got need-based aid. So merit-based aid is usually awarded to recognize student achievement, whether it's academic, whether it's athletic, whether it's artistic, etc. 
Um, usually, um, there's a renewability uh, component to it, but not always. So that's a specific question that you want to ask of the institution that you're looking at. Firstly, of course you want to ask, do you offer merit-based aid? Do you offer need-based aid? Do you offer a, a combination of both? It's really important to take really close looks at the individual financial aid offices websites of each of the schools that you're looking at because it'll explain these things out for you. They'll let you know whether they offer merit-based aid, need-based aid, or a combination of both. So merit-based aid is not necessarily offered at every college. And again, you want to check the website to, to see uh, how to apply and how to, most importantly, uh, how to maintain eligibility. So if you get a merit-based award in the first year, your next question should be, what do I have to do to maintain this eligibility for next year? And not all um, merit-based awards are renewable. You do want to definitely check what the deadlines are and meet those early deadlines. Most of the time for a merit-based type of uh, application of financial aid, there's going to be a separate application that might be part of the admission application uh, paperwork. And again, check the deadlines because some of them could be coming up as early as November 1st, which as we know is right around the corner. The vast majority of aid that's administered in the United States is need-based aid. So that's based on a uh, family's financial eligibility, so-called need. So there's a basic formula that we use to determine need. It's the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution. It equals the demonstrated need. And every school will attempt to meet that need to the extent that they're able based on the resources of that institution. So especially when we talk about federal aid, that's administered and determined by a standardized formula. Need-based aid will consist of scholarship and grant eligibility, work-study eligibility, and student loans at the vast majority of schools in the country. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, most schools uh, offer need-based aid. And there's this concept that I want to make sure that you're aware of is called uh, satisfactory academic progress. So you don't get to just keep taking financial aid, sort of go to school, don't do very well, and continue that on for a long time. So it's both a GPA component, so you have to maintain uh, eligibility to uh, maintain enrollment at the institution, generally speaking, that's going to be a 2.0 or a C average or better. But it's also based on the number of credits that were attempted relative to those that were completed. So again, you can't just go in, register full-time, get your financial aid, and then only complete one or two of your classes that will eventually catch up with you. So it's based on the GPA and the number of credits attempted versus those completed to maintain satisfactory academic progress. If your student runs afoul of satisfactory academic progress, most financial aid offices have the ability for the student to do an appeal and say, you know, I've got my act together again now, and this is my academic plan, and you present it to the financial aid, typically the director of the financial aid office at that institution, and they'll say, okay, we'll put you on probation for a semester, or maybe two, and we'll see how you do. And if you bring your grades back up, then you come off of probation and continue on your enrollment. So it's an important factor. Um, most students satisfy that without problem. So let's talk about the application process next. So, in terms of the financial aid timeline, I can't emphasize enough the importance of deadlines. At some schools, you'll find out that, um, like mine, uh, upper class students find out they're more like suggestions than actual deadlines. But at other institutions, the deadlines absolutely matter, and they matter a lot. I've worked at another institution that literally, if you were one day late on the application, you took yourself out of 40% of the scholarship money that you'd otherwise be considered especially those institutions that are, you know, modestly resourced, they're going to stick to these deadlines in a very big way. So you really want to make sure that, again, on the Financial Aid Office website, I would even recommend you start up a spreadsheet with each of the institutions, what the application requirements are, what the deadlines are. You want to make sure that you meet the earliest one because that will satisfy the requirement at, at virtually all the schools that you're looking at. So check the deadlines, make sure that you're meeting them. In terms of early decision and early action schools, if your student is looking at those as a senior, um, many of those are coming up right now. Our, our early action, early decision deadlines are typically right around November 1st. So you want to make sure that you're getting your applications in on time. Um, in terms of regular decision, you generally find that March 1st is generally going to be the date. Um, some schools might be a little bit earlier than that in February in terms of the application materials. And again, what uh, MIFA has is they've got this really cool application manager, which is kind of like the spreadsheet I was just suggesting, that you can go to the MIFA.org site and look up the college application manager. And it's this great little thing that gives you all the different, you can put in a lot of information about the schools, what their application requirements are, what the deadlines are, etc. So it's a good resource to be able to help you uh, stay organized in this process. And the organization is really, really important because you'll find, especially if your student is applying to multiple schools, you're going to find slight differences and variations between the application dates, 
the deadlines, the application materials, etc. So you want to make sure that you're keeping those all straight from school to school. And again, if you've got lots of them, it's easy for them to kind of get mixed up and jumbled in, in your and your students' heads. So the more that you can keep yourself organized, the better off you're going to be. So every school in the country requires the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or the FAFSA form. And I would underline the free part of that several times. Yellow highlighter, the whole shebang, right? Uh, because the last thing that you want to do is pay somebody 100 bucks to help you fill out the FAFSA. There are FAFSA days around the state, we'll talk about those a little bit near the end of the presentation, um, that you have financial aid administrators that are sitting right there, typically at a high school or a college, usually in a computer lab, where you've got people that are right there that you come up with your, you show up with your 18, 2018 tax information, who will help you fill out the forms, so you can just get it done in a half an hour or 40 minutes or whatever. So it's a great way to get that done. You don't want to pay for any, anybody to do that for you. So the FAFSA form is required by every institution to determine eligibility for federal student aid. So again, that'd be federal Pell Grants, federal work study, federal student loans. Those were all determined by the calculation from the FAFSA form and its corresponding federal methodology. Some state schools, particularly state schools, will use the FAFSA to determine eligibility for their own institutional aid as well. So that might be the only application that you have to do for that particular institution but every school is going to require this form. It became available on October 1st. Um, they now have a new uh, mobile application that you can complete the FAFSA on your phone. It's kind of a small screen. I recommend that you do it on a PC, but they have this tool available uh, for you. This is the first year of that uh, mobile application. You'll need to log in and sign your application with what's called an FSAID. And that website, fsaid.ed.gov, is where you go to apply for the FSAID. That serves as your electronic signature for all of your dealings with the federal government as it relates to federal aid. So it counts as your signature on the FAFSA form. So your student will have to have an FSA ID, and at least one parent will have to have an FSA ID in order to complete and finish off the last step of the FAFSA form. Um, it's important to keep track of your FSA ID because it's a bit of a hassle to get it replaced. And the last thing that you want to do is have to be trying to get that replaced because you're up against deadlines and it just creates a lot of tension that's unnecessary. So I would, I would recommend that even if you haven't done the forms yet and you're planning on doing them soon, get your FSA ID first and then move on to the FAFSA form. So there are webinars that are available uh, at mefa.org slash events. It's important to keep in mind that you complete the FAFSA each and every academic year. Okay. Any questions so far? Are we doing okay? Nobody's falling asleep on me at all? Okay, good. This stuff is about as much fun as watching the paint dry. I totally get that, but it's really important information, so I'm happy that you stay with me. What gets reported on the FAFSA form? So generally, uh, the student's citizenship status. Uh, so they have, the student has to be a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen to be eligible to complete the FAFSA and to be eligible for federal student aid. In the case of parents that are non-citizens or not uh, permanent residents, they would want to put in zeros for all of the uh, input for the social security number. And at the end of the process of completing the FAFSA, they have to print a signature page and sign that and mail it off. All the instructions are right there uh, on the uh, application itself uh, because they can't get an FSA ID. You can list up to 10 schools where your child is looking at attending on the FAFSA form. And if, the, if your student is looking at 12 schools, after you get back the student aid report from the FAFSA, so it's basically the output document that comes back to you. You can make a correction to add in those additional schools. it will take the first couple off and add on new schools. Yes. How many schools can you apply to on a Up to 10 at a time. So 10 schools at a time on the FAFSA. So after the 10, um, What you'll get, so when, and I've got the next slide coming oh, to this, but it's a, right after you've done the FAFSA form, within a, a week or two, the student gets back a student aid report. It's either going to be physical, physically mailed to you, or if you put a, an email address on the FAFSA form, it's going to get an email there. That gives you the opportunity to review all the information that you put on the FAFSA and make any necessary corrections if there are any. We'll talk more about this in a little more detail in just a second. So in terms of parents, uh, parents, uh, including same-sex parents that are married, we're going to look for information for both, both of those parents. Uh, all parents who live together, whether they're married or not, so the biological parents of the child, their information is going to be required. In the case of divorced or separated parents, it's going to be looking for the information for the custodial parent only. So the non-custodial parent is excluded from the FAFSA form. If the custodial parent has remarried, it's custodial parent and step-parent information. 
So that's important that you don't want to get married, you know, this year right before your child's going to college. That's supposed to be fine. Uh, and in the case of legal guardians, if a student is in a guardianship, um, their, their guardians are not considered their parents. By indicating that they are in an active guard, uh, guardianship, they are considered independent for financial aid purposes, so only the student information gets put down in that. And then the number of family members that the parents will supply more than 50% of their total support during the academic year. It's actually July 1st through June 30th, but you know, the academic year. And most importantly is the number of children attending college. So all this information gets put onto the FAFSA. If you've um, incorrectly indicated that one of the siblings of your child is going to be attending college, and then you find out that he or she is not going to be attending, you want to make sure you want to, you want to notify the financial aid office as soon as possible because this really makes a big impact. It's a large variable that drives the expected family contribution. Do you put in the child that's going to be attending college? Like that would be one if you have one going in, but not now? Right, so the child that you're doing the application for, that is one child in college, because it's during the, the coming academic year, right. Um, conversely, if you thought that Susie, Sister Susie wasn't going to be enrolled, but it turns out that she is in fact going to be enrolled, let the financial aid office know right away, because that's going to make a big impact and a positive way for you as a family, in terms of your expected family contribution. What else gets put on there? The financial information. So both the student and the parent income for 2018, get put on the 2021 FAFSA, so that's next year's FAFSA. Um, it includes both taxable and untaxed income. Examples of untaxed income would include child support received by the custodial parent. It would also include contributions that are made on a pre-tax basis to retirement. They typically show up in either box 12 or 14 on the W-2 forms. You don't include employer contributions to your retirement, but only your contributions that you're making. That's considered part of the total income. And then in terms of parent and student assets, you do include things like cash and savings and checking accounts. You do um, include investments like CDs and stocks and bonds and mutual funds that are not included as part of the retirement assets, so outside of retirement assets. Um, and you do include other, other properties. So if you have rental properties or if you own a multifamily home and you rent part of that out, the rental portion, the equity of the rental portion is included as an investment on the FAFSA form. Um, and you do include 529 accounts. If the parent is the owner of the 529, it gets included just as a regular parent asset. If it's a grandparent or aunt or uncle that owns the 529 plan, it does not get reported on the FAFSA. But it's important to know if they make contributions to the student's bill, the year in which those contributions are made are considered untaxed income to the student. And remember, we're using a two-year lag 2018 income information for the 2021 school year. So it's the calendar year that those uh, contributions were made to the student's bill, right? So if they're doing that next fall, that's the fall of 2020, that won't show up until the 22-23 FAFSA, and any contributions made in the spring of 21 don't show up until the 23-24 FAFSA, okay? Um, what you don't include is you don't include your primary residence. Again, if you're in a multifamily home and you're renting part of it, the rental part is considered, but your primary residence is not considered. If you're in a single family home, completely ignored. It does not look at the value of your retirement plans at all. And uh, likewise, uh, the cash value of life insurance is ignored. And small family businesses that have fewer than 100 employees, completely ignored as well. So debt can be taken into account against some of these assets. That's gonna be on a case by case, school by school basis. But it's worth asking and worth uh, seeing if your school will take into account some of your consumer debt that you have related to these kinds of assets. Yes? I just want to make sure that the things that you include are as of the end of the application. It's as of the day you're doing your application. All right, so the asset picture gets reported as of the day you're doing your application. So you don't want to do your FAFSA form the day you get paid. Pay all your bills first and then do your FAFSA form because you want that lower asset figure in there. Okay, and some schools will require an additional application in addition to the FAFSA. So schools like mine, so typically more resourced institutions that have substantial institutional funds that they're looking to allocate, will require a second form, the CSS profile form. It's not required by every school, but again, you check the financial aid office website and you find out if it is required of the institution that your child is looking at. It's a uh, fee-based form, so it's $25 for the first school, and it's $16 for each additional school. So. Um, you know, this is probably going to be a smaller list of schools that require the profile than those that require the FAFSA form. It's also available now as of October 1st, so you can complete that at your leisure at this point. 
making sure that you're meeting the deadlines, right? In the case of divorced or separated parents, the beginning expectation is that information from both biological parents will be collected for, them, for the profile form. They'll do, each parent will do a separate profile application, and the calculation will take into account each of their separate resources. Most schools will show a combined figure for that expected family contribution, but upon the student's request, we break it out that this part is mom's, this part is dad's, which might help facilitate a conversation uh, for how we're gonna pay for school. Every school that requires the profile form typically has a non-custodial parent waiver petition that can be submitted. If it's not reasonable, uh, mom or dad hasn't been in the child's life you know, for 16 of their 17 years now, or if it's unsafe, uh, you know, there's a history of abuse, there's uh, documentation that you have, police reports, that kind of stuff. So there's a form that the student fills out and explains what is the relationship between the student and the non-custodial parent and why they believe it's not reasonable or safe for them to contact that parent to ask for their information. And, you know, this is difficult stuff because typically, you know, this is bringing up some, some uh, hard stuff to deal with, but I would just encourage you to encourage your student, if you're going this route, to be as forthcoming as possible. It's completely confidential, it stays within the financial aid office, no other office at the institution is privy to this information whatsoever. And so, and then it's also gonna require um, a disinterested third party letter. So some letter of corroboration that backs it up. That could be a clergy member, it could be a therapist, it could be somebody from the guidance office at the high school that says, you know, the student's been here for you know, four or six years or whatever and we haven't heard anything from the young parent. Uh, it could be a copy of a police report, those sorts of things would all be acceptable documentation. And then the school will make a determination and say, yep, we've waived the non-custodial parent or um, the explanation that you gave didn't really rise to the level. And again, this has to be reserved for fairly extreme family circumstances, the, the answer of, I'm just not going to pay, in and of itself, it's not going to be a reason to, to waive that non-custodial parent. So and then some schools have their own financial aid office application as well. Typically, that's usually part of the admission application. Again, check the website, find out exactly what is required of your application uh, pieces and components to find out if there is an institutional application that needs to be completed as well. Okay, so after you apply, so once you've completed the application, the student, uh, the colleges in the uh, state receive the data electronically. If you've indicated, you know, UMass Amherst or whatever school on the list of schools that are getting your FAFSA information, they'll get that all electronically. Likewise, if you're in the state of Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts will get all that information electronically. And so the student will receive this student aid report either electronically uh, by email or by physical mail, depending upon the email address. This is where it's really important too that um, if a student's gonna put their own individual email address on the FAFSA form, make sure it's the email address that they check frequently because almost all the communication from institutions now is done electronically via email to the student only, so it's never typically gonna be going to the parent. So it'd be a violation of the Federal Educational and Family Rights Act, FERPA, FERPA Rights and Privacy Act. So um, to avoid that, we're gonna be sending that information only to the student. The student, of course, should be sharing that information with the people that are helping them pay for school, whether it's parents or guardians, what have you. If you have special circumstances. So it is formulaic at the outset, right? So if you have certain similar circumstances to the person next to you, the output should be pretty similar. Your job, is to, at, for, at your job as consumers is to make sure that you're informing the financial aid office about your individual, unique, changing family circumstances. And that always has to be in writing, but you want to make sure that you're sending in a note to the financial aid office at each of the schools. Make sure you do change the school name. So if you're sending one to Worcester State and one to UMass, don't send both of them address to dear financial aid office at UMass. Don't do that. Um, but make sure each one of the schools knows about your individual circumstances. So some schools, um, some applications may be selected for the federal verification process. So that typically requires some additional documentation, typically a, a verification worksheet where you list down all of the family members and their ages and if they're attending another institution, where they're attending and what their expected graduation date is. And it also requires um, uh, income documentation. So there's the data retrieval tool, or so-called DRT, that when you're filling out your FAFSA form, they'll uh, ask you if you want to employ the data retrieval tool. And what that does is it takes the IRS tax data for you and brings it into your FAFSA form. For security, you can't see the numbers that are being transmitted as they're being transmitted, but when you've submitted the form and you get back the student aid report, 
that will show you all the information that you put on your application and allow for any corrections or updates if they're necessary, which should be the case because that data is coming directly from the IRS. So that data retrieval tool, or DRT, satisfies the income requirements for verification as well. If you didn't do that on the initial application, you can always go into your, your FAFSA and make a correction, similar to changing the list of schools, to then ask the DRT to take place where the, the data retrieval tool brings in your IRS tax information. If you're not comfortable for, with that, you don't want to do that. There's some filing statuses that you're not eligible to use DRT, so Mary filing separately. Um, if you file an amended return, if you're the victim of identity theft, um, there's a couple of others that you're not, they will tell you specifically based on your filing status whether you're eligible to use the DRT or not. But it's a great way to satisfy the income requirements for verification. If you don't do that, you can always get a tax transcript from the IRS. It takes a little doing, a couple of phone calls, that sort of stuff, takes some time. But it's another way that you can satisfy the tax documentation requirements. Um, so you want to make sure it's a tax transcript, not an account transcript. They're two different things. Um, and then another option for this coming year only is that assigned tax return for 2018 will satisfy income documentation as well. That's because the DRT was not working over the last year or two off and on, so they decided that a regular assigned tax return will satisfy that income requirement as well. A lot of schools, if you don't turn in the verification documents, will consider your application incomplete and won't award you financial aid until you've completed the verification process. And then the colleges review all that information and determine eligibility for aid. So the verification worksheet, just like I was just talking about. So this is the verification process that I just mentioned. So again, uh, the college is required to verify the financial aid applications. It's about 30% of applications that get selected for verification. And it could be based on a number of things. It could be just a random selection. It could be the ratios of the income to income taxes paid. You know, there's a couple of different reasons why you might get selected. And um, so schools can select uh, a student for verification in the Department of Education. As I said, you have to comply with these requests to receive aid. We talked about the additional documentation already. So you want to make sure that if you're getting, if your student is getting emails from the school, A, you're checking what those emails have to say, especially if it's you're missing this, that, or the other thing. Most schools now have financial aid portals as well. So you go into the portal with your, your student username and your student um, password, and you can check the array of required documents for the particular student and see what the status of those documents are, whether they've been received or whether they're still outstanding. So many schools have these financial aid portals, and it's a great way for a student to be able to serve themselves sort of proactively as to what is still required for their application materials. How the decisions you So in terms of need-based aid, the, every school is going to take the cost of attendance or student expense budget, and you know, hear those two terms used interchangeably. And they're going to include both the direct or build expenses from the institution. If your student's living on campus, that's going to be tuition and fees and room and board. And then they're also going to take into account the indirect or non-build expenses, so you don't get a bill from the institution. But um, the institution knows that you're going to incur these expenses by virtue of having a student. Books and supplies, transportation, personal expenses. So the combination of all those is called the cost of attendance or student expense budget. And that represents one year of these costs. So the expected family contribution is what gets calculated from all of your application materials. So it doesn't represent extra money at the end of the year. It's a measure of your family's ability to absorb educational costs over time. And whether you know our school is asking you know, $900 from a family or $75,000 from a family, Nobody pulls out the checkbook in the pen and says, oh, I, I make that out to whom? So be prepared that many families will take advantage of the different financing options that are available. So um, every school, the FAFSA calculation should be similar. And then if they require that second application, the profile form, depending upon the complexity of your financial life, you might find a little variability in, that, in those outcomes. So if you're, if you're kind of a vanilla W-2 wage earning employee, you should have more consistency in what calculates out for the expected family contribution. As you get into more complexity like self-employment, rental properties, you know, ownership interest in either a partnership or a corporation, that's where you're going to find a little more variability from school to school. And the big thing is, again, the, the parents, to the extent that they're able to have the primary responsibility to pay for your child. Similarly, to the child, to the extent that they're able, has a responsibility to contribute to their own education. And again, because it's formulaic, similar circumstances, similar outcome, 
Your job is to differentiate yourself so that they can take into account your unique circumstances within the, within the calculation. Um, and again, the family contribution gets adjusted to take into account more than one child in college. The more children you have in college at the same time, the lower the expected family contribution will be. If you've got two kids in college, you don't have twice the resources that you have. You still have the same amount of resources, but it gets divided between the two children. And uh, calculators are a really great way to sort of uh, find out what your expectation might be uh, either right now or you can do some what-if scenarios for the future. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that. So every school is required to have a net price calculator on their financial aid office website. Net price by definition is that cost of attendance that we were just looking at a second ago minus just the grants and scholarship, the gift. Okay, so a lot of schools will throw in loans, most schools will include loans and work as part of the financial aid awards. But when you look at the net price, that gives you the ability to sort of look at apples to apples across institutions and see what the actual net price is going to be. Um, the net price calculator might also ask questions about family finances, which it definitely will, and then student academics, because some of these schools will say, well, we're a merit-based school, and based on the information you provided, you might be eligible for a merit-based scholarship as well. This is a great way for, the, for you as families, parents and students, to start the, the, the conversation about how are we going to actually pay our family contribution. And you want to start that as early as possible so that you can make appropriate plans. So these calculators are a great way to sort of estimate what your family contribution might be. You can also say, okay, so if my income goes up by you know, 10% next year, what does that come out to be? Well, what if next year when now we've got two kids in college, you can rerun the calculator and see what that does to the bottom line as well. So it gives you this personal estimated net price of your college, it displays federal and institutional aid, and by putting in the academic information, some schools might talk to you about the merit-based aid that's available as well. So like I was saying, it, the basic need-based financial aid formula is just this. So it's the cost of attendance, again, the direct and indirect expenses, minus the expected family contribution that gets calculated from all of your application materials. That equals the financial aid eligibility. That represents the maximum eligibility uh, uh, for a particular student. And schools will try their best to meet that full financial aid eligibility. It's going to be dependent upon the resources of the institution. One half a second about the net price calculator. One second. Um, garbage in, it's garbage out. So you want to be really careful and make sure that you're putting in as accurate numbers as you possibly can. The most common mistake is families forget to include the untaxed income like the child support received, like the contributions on pre-tax basis to retirement. So I would just caution you on that. Just make sure that you're as accurate as possible can be. Okay, so for you families that have done a good job and have said yes, Sorry. it's okay. Yes. Yep. Each individual office has is required by law to have a net price calculator. So for you families that have done a good job and have saved from some money for college, yay you! That gives you some some uh, options in terms of how you're going to pay for college. And what I'm showing you here on this slide is that um, changes in the asset picture for a family really don't have as big a, a, an impact on the bottom line as a similar change in income. So both the federal and institutional calculations are much more income sensitive than asset sensitive up or down. So in this case, we have three families, all with income of $75,000. Family A has got no assets, so their calculation with four in the family, one in college, using the 2021 federal methodology, this assumes that the student has no income and no assets. The calculation comes to about $7,200. Family B, they have assets of $75,000. Their contribution only goes up to about $10,500. So about a $3,200 increase, given a $75,000 increase in, in assets. Family C goes to $150,000 in assets, and their calculated contribution comes to just over $14,500, only about a $7,400 change from family A to family C. So assets don't have that big of an impact on the bottom line. Generally between three and five percent of assets are going to be assessed in determining the expected family contribution. Whereas, compare and contrast that to um, the impact of the income changes on the family contribution. So same thing, four in the family, one in college, using next year's fed federal methodology, assuming the student has no income or assets. Family A's got income of 75,000, they have assets, all three families have assets of $50,000, that comes up to about a $9,000 contribution for family A. Now, a $25,000 increase in income to $100,000, keeping the assets steady at $50,000, is now about $17,500. So you can see that's an $8,500 increase in the expected family contribution. So a much bigger impact for only being a $25,000 increase in income. And then family C, when you get to $150,000 of income, 
that's a $33,000 contribution or a $24,000 increase from family A for basically doubling their income. So again, this is to show you that changes in income, up or down, have a much bigger bottom line impact on your expected family contribution than the corresponding same change in, in asset picture. Have we got that on, on, on that? Okay, good. All right, so, and so how the formula works, right? So this is just showing you visual learners that you know, you've got four colleges. Um, they have varying costs of attendance uh, from 70,000 at College A down to 10,000 at College D. All the family contributions are held constant at $5,000. And it just shows you that a, a very expensive school could have a lot more financial aid eligibility. So you want to aim high. Don't rule out a, co a school because of its high cost. Generally speaking, the most expensive school schools in the country are going to have the most advantageous financial aid programs. Um, so if your student is academically viable at a very expensive, very uh, hoity-toity school, aim high, you know, give it a shot, absolutely. Um, that's not to say that College D is a bad college by any means, but it might be a great opportunity for, especially the first couple of years, to be able to go to a much lower cost school, get your gen eds out of the way, and then transfer uh, into one of the universities, particularly here in Massachusetts. So, more for the visual learners here. So the empty bucket is the cost of attendance, the 45000 it first gets filled uh, with the $5,000 family contribution. Then this particular institution had some grant and scholarship eligibility that they were able to award the student. Of course, as the vast majority of schools do, they gave the student the maximum first year student loan, came up with a little work study money, but this institution wasn't quite able to meet all of the needs of all of their students based on the resources. So in this case, the expected family contribution is really gonna be the unmet need as well as the expected family contribution. So in this example, 10,500. Now again, there's ways that the indirect expenses, you can knock those down by buying used books, by being frugal in terms of your personal expenses and those types of things. Um, but generally speaking, this is a way to, to conceptualize the fact that it's the expected family contribution plus any unmet need that's really the family's responsibility. Now these two slides I really want you to pay attention carefully to. Because uh, they, we still call them award letters, but again, now the student gets an email that says, go and look at your financial aid portal, and you look at this online. And so each one of these schools has a cost of 45000 The expected family contribution is the same at 5000 so their eligibility is that total of 40000 for each school. And so you can see instantly, right, on the top line of the grants and scholarships, all things are not created equal, right? So College A has got 32000 of, of scholarship eligibility. College B has got 25000 College C's got 17,000. They all are awarding the same student loans, the same amount of work study, and you can see that the totals are not the same because each school has got a different unmet need figure there. So the totals of the award that you get can vary from, from school to school. Now, how would we determine the net price at each of these institutions? You would take that $45,000 cost of attendance and subtract out from that the granted scholarship eligibility. And that would be a great way of seeing, well, College A has got a more advantageous financial aid package than, than B does and A and B have a more advantageous aid policy than College C does. So that's a good way to be able to compare across different institutions. Because some schools, you want to not only look at the totals of your financial aid award, but you want to look at the types of aid that are offered to you. So in this case, it looks like the total is the same for all three schools. Right? Every school is awarding uh, 35,000 and they're all showing 5,000 of unmet need. But again, the scholarship and grant number is completely different for the three schools, right? 27, 17, and zero. And the thing that I would bring to your attention is the brown bars, the parent loans, is really misleading and deceptive for an institution to throw in a non-need-based parent loan into the initial financial aid award to make the reward look more generous than it really is. If a school does not include a parent loan as part of the initial award, the students can still take advantage of parent loans to help finance the education. So this is where, again, you don't want to look just at the totals, but you want to look at the components of the financial aid award and make sure that, again, you're comparing apples to apples. The net price of these three institutions is going to be wildly different, right? It's going to cost you 45000 to attend college C and less to attend college B or A, right? So you want to compare apples to apples. And um, a school that's going to throw in a big parent loan like this, it might be indicative of your experience at that school for four years. So pay close attention and make sure that you understand the, the types and and components of financial aid awards. Okay, paying for college. Um, there's no one right way to pay for college. There's no one 
there's no wrong way to pay for college. It's going to be different from family to family to family based on, A, their resources, their income levels, and, you know, uh, it could be a cultural difference. There's lots of reasons why families decide that they don't want to borrow loans. But in this example, the balance due, and uh, we're talking annual figures here, but the balance due is $20,000 to the, to the school for the, for the fall, for example. So some families will take advantage of their past savings and take some money out of that, either in the form of what the student has saved and or what the parent has saved. Some families will uh, take advantage of their present income and take advantage of payment plans. In Massachusetts, most schools are semester schools, so instead of one large payment for each semester, you can split that up over five payments per semester generally. It's gonna be different from school to school, so you wanna check what um, financing options are available at each institution. And then families will also take advantage of encumbering their future income in the form of either parent or student loans. And so, again, there's no one, way to, one right way to do this, there's no wrong way to do this, and the proportions, you can use all three of these together. Um, the proportions may be different from family to family, depending upon how much is responsible and how much the bill outstanding is. But this is a great way to sort of conceptualize that you can take advantage of payment plans, you can take some money out of your savings, and you can do some borrowing for the future and pay that back over time. Where there's a will, there's a way to finance an education in this country. Other things that you want to keep in mind. Um, with starting on a community college, be advantageous. Again, that, that graph that we just looked at a couple of minutes ago with the four colleges, it might be a great way to be able to get a couple of years of education under your belt. Uh, there's a lot of excellent transfer opportunities into the universities here in Massachusetts. You want to, of course, consider the number of children that you're going to be ending up sending to college. You want to look at and think about the four years of enrollment as opposed to just the first year. And in that regard, one of the questions that I would, I would encourage you to ask each school that your child is looking at is very, very directly saying, asking, by policy, do financial aid packages change from year one to subsequent years? They should be very honest and open with you and say, yes, first year students get this kind of a package, second year students get that kind of a package, third and fourth year students get this, particularly when we're talking about the student loans. So you might be at an information session and a, and a financial aid administrator might say, you know, we package first year students with $2,000 in loans. And you're thinking to yourself, that over four years, 8,000, that's really not that bad for educational indebtedness. We're, what you're really driving at, because that student loan limits increase, as we saw on that slide, right, as the student progresses through school. And again, the big difference is, is that you're thinking in your mind 8,000, and it turns out that your student's gonna come out 27,000. You should have a very straightforward answer to that question, to each of the questions that you're asking. It shouldn't feel vague, it, doesn't, it shouldn't feel like smoke and mirrors with this financial aid stuff. You should be getting a very straightforward answer about this. And again, if you're not getting straight answers, that could be indicative of what your four years at that institution might look like. As I said at the very beginning, um, you definitely want to make sure before your student comes in and just asks for their student loan, what that means in terms of student indebtedness, what that means in terms of a monthly payment. Um, students really need to be um, reasonable and, uh, and proactive to, to look at what the starting salaries are of their potential careers. If you're, if you're at a, a very um, low or modest income level, for the most part, generally speaking, for a particular career, um, that's probably not one that you want to crank a whole ton of student loan out, uh, debt on. Um, by the same token, there's a great broad uh, array of careers that are available out there. Your student wants to keep in mind whether we're looking at graduate school or not. When your student, the best part about being a parent is that, not the best part, but in terms of financial aid, when the student checks the box that says, I'm going to go to graduate school next year on the FAFSA form, or I'm going to professional school. They're now independent students, so parents' information is no longer required on the FAFSA form, which makes a big difference. And when you're talking about graduate school, the loan limits that a, an independent graduate student can borrow are much higher than the undergraduate limits. Again, you want to keep in mind how much you're borrowing, what that relates to in a monthly payment, what's the likelihood of coming out and getting a good paying job, all those things. If you're going to borrow a private loan, and again, you'd want to do that after only maximizing your federal student loan eligibility, um, the, the, you definitely want to know your credit score. Many of the alternative loans um, that are out there, so things like, uh, and I'm just throwing out random names, the City Bank and Wells Fargo and you know, those types of institutions that lend money, Discover, exactly, you know, those types of things. The student is going to be the, the primary borrower, and most 17-year-olds don't have any credit, so it's going to require a co-signer, which is going to put the parent on the hook for 14, 15, 16% loan, as opposed to uh, borrowing their own parent loan through the federal government at more like 7%. So keep in mind your credit score and what that's going to relate to in terms of an interest rate. And again, compare the net price, the cost of attendance minus the grant aid, so that you have a basis 
that you can compare and, and sort of have an apples to apples comparison. So this is, um, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but this is what I was talking about. There are a couple of great programs through the state of Massachusetts to be able to do your first couple of years at a community college and uh, then go and move on to the, the four-year universities in the state. Uh, it's a great way to get the gen eds out of the way. It makes the total cost of attendance over the four years a lot more affordable. Um, there's programs, at, so you'd want to look at the mass.edu slash mass transfer because there's very specific guidelines that you have to follow and course selection that you have to follow. But if you play by their rules, um, the application process is easier. You don't have to do an essay. You're guaranteed that all of your credits that you've earned at the community college level are going to transfer to your four-year um, degree. There might be a freeze on the amount of the tuition, uh, either an increase, and or there might be a discount by the form of a tuition credit at uh, the four-year schools as well. So that's a, that's a great way to save some money. Um, and then also, if you have uh, programs that are not offered within the state, but are offered in the other New England states, instead of paying out-of-state tuition, they may offer you a reduced uh, tuition amount, so you're not paying full out-of-state tuition. You might, be, you might not get all the way to in-state tuition, uh, but you might get a significant dis discount from what it would otherwise be. The NEBHE is the New England Board of Higher Education, and this is the tuition break that they call it. So it's, it's worth some investigation as well. And then free resources. So um, learn about financial aid. Again, arm yourself with as much information as you possibly can. Learn the lingo. You know, pay attention to glossaries. Review that information. I could have given you know, most of this entire presentation without using whole words because you know, there's so many acronyms that are involved in financial aid. So the more that you familiarize yourself with the language, the better you're able to communicate with financial aid offices. Um, you want to be asking about the renewability criteria. Most schools are going to require that you reapply each academic year, particularly need-based schools. They're going to uh, make a new determination of your need each year, uh, and then they're going to do their best to fill them. The other question that I would encourage you all to ask is, uh, what about the treatment of outside scholarships, private scholarships? The government requires that every college and university take outside scholarships into account within the financial aid award. So generally speaking, they're not going to replace your family contribution. The reason it's a great question to ask is because it's up to the individual institution what part of their financial aid award gets replaced. So some schools will take it right off of their own scholarship. Nice essay on your part, you just saved us a thousand bucks, no net benefit to the student at all. Some will take half off of their scholarship, half off the self-help, which would be the work and the loans. Virtually every school, if there's an unmet need, like in our barrel example, they'll allow that to fill the unmet need before impacting the financial aid award. And then some schools will take it off of the least advantageous type of aid you know, usually the work component before impacting any of the free money. So, it's a great question to ask. Treatment of outside scholarships, by policy, the financial aid packages change from year to year. Those are the two questions I would encourage you to ask of every institution. Ask about financial uh, special circumstances. You know, if there's, especially if those changes have taken place since the time that you've completed the application. They're generally going to be, and appeals are going to have to be in writing. Um, an ineffective appeal is one where you say, this really just way too expensive, we can't do it. What's more effective is to say, it is really expensive, we don't think we can do it. Here's some of the special circumstances that we want to make sure that you're aware of. We've had uh, an unemployment situation in our family. We've had a separation or divorce. Heaven forbid one of the parents has passed away. Uh, we had really high medical and dental expenses. We've been paying, we help out Grammy to a certain extent each month. So it's not just mention it, but also quantify it. So not only did we have high medical expenses last year, it was actually $10,000 last year that we had out-of-pocket medical expenses. We help out bring to the tune of $100 a month. So if you want to not only tell us about the circumstances, but quantify those amounts as well. Find out uh, about additional resources and additional details that you have, so that the open house and orientation programs. Find out if there are additional resources that are available. Again, ask about the outside scholarship treatment. And then in terms of contacting the financial aid office, um, generally speaking, we're a very friendly group. So if you have questions and your first contact is by phone, you're probably gonna get one of the frontline staff, you're probably not gonna get right to a dean. But they'll be able to help you with questions about policy, um, how to appeal your award. Um, you could request uh, an appointment to have an in-person meeting. Um, you could have a phone call, you could email with them. So there's a number of different ways you can communicate with the financial aid office, whichever is more convenient and uh, easier for you. So you do want to pay attention to um, the different resources that are out there. And one of them is FAFSA Day. I have to find my slide on FAFSA Day here real quick. Hang on. There are a few in the area. So basically, again, as I mentioned, 
Um, there's financial aid professionals that you can go to the locations, they can help you fill out the forms, check, it's done. It's, out of, it's off, off the list, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, Framingham High School will have one on November 3rd at 1 in the afternoon. Worcester State's going to do one on um, November 16th at 1. And Amherst High School is going to do one next week on the 25th at 7 p.m. So those are just a couple of them in your local area. FAFSAday.org is where you register and find out the other locations that are available in the state. And the Educational Opportunity Centers are another good way to get some financial aid information. Um, it's free financial help, so you don't have to pay for somebody to give you this information. And this mass, uh, edco.org is their, their website. So what happens? So after you've been accepted, after you've gotten your financial aid award, uh, MIFA provides these after the college acceptance seminars. Generally speaking, they're going to be during the month of uh, April, maybe March. Uh, not every location is uh, available for those, so you'd want to check with MIFA as to where those locations are. By doing your evaluation and giving MIFA your email address, they'll automatically send you out information about when these uh, uh, seminars are available. Um, there's also webinars for the same information. And it allows you to, to look through the financial aid award, again, comparing the types and the amounts of, of financial aid awards to help you decipher that. They'll help you walk through the college bill and what that's going to mean in terms of financial aid relative to the cost. They'll help you with the details about the payment plans. They'll talk about the different loan options that are available. And they'll help you to communicate effectively with the financial aid offices. So these are great, um, a great opportunity for you to uh, get some additional information. Again, the financial aid office at each of the schools that you're applying to and have been accepted at would be happy to answer these same types of uh, questions as well. So what you do now is you complete your uh, your seminar evaluation, you sign up for the MIFA emails, you get your FSA ID. Again, the student will, and the parent will need that if they're going to, to sign their FAFSA form. If there's any borrowing that's going to take place, that counts as your electronic signature on the uh, electronic master promissory notes. Make sure you research the deadlines, 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 deadlines. I can't emphasize that enough. And what's required for each school for application materials. Again, sign up for the webinar at uh, MIFA.org events. And um, again, they've got this uh, publication, the College Admission and Financial Aid Timeline, on their website as well. You can connect with me on social media and all of these different ways. And I'm happy to take any questions from the group. So if you're sitting there thinking about a question, and you're like, that's a stupid question. First off, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And 10 other people in the audience are thinking that exact same question. So if you ask, you're going to help nine other people in the community. Anything? Yes. Right. So early decision, by definition, is binding early decision. So you agree that if you're admitted in the early decision process, that you're going to withdraw all of your other admission applications. The big advantage you're getting looked at for admission in a much smaller applicant pool, typically. Big disadvantage, one financial aid award. No basis of comparison from school to school to school. So these are things that you have to weigh. That's where the net price calculators are helpful. Some schools will allow you to be released if it's the result of the financial aid eligibility that you received and the award that you received. But you want to be really careful and ask that question. If I'm released from early decision, am I still admitted? Or is my admission no longer in place? So those are two really good follow-up questions. And um, early action is a little bit different. Regular decision, of course, much bigger applicant pools, and you have more time and have the ability to compare multiple financial aid awards. Well, you'd want to appeal. If your initial award was insufficient to attend, you'd want to appeal the award in writing, explain what circumstances that really didn't feel like you had the opportunity to explain either on the financial aid applications or on your federal tax forms and, and ask that question. Absolutely. And you want to ask these questions all in advance as best you can. Obviously you can't appeal the award until you get the award, but you want to do as much research that you can. You want to ask, is there a difference between the average financial aid package for your early decision group or is it the regular decision group? Do you take into account the same types of the unique or changing family circumstances? Is the scholarship, the average scholarship different between the two groups? So there's some ways you can kind of suss out information that maybe it's, it isn't as advantageous to apply early decision versus regular decision. So that's going to be a family conversation, a family decision. 
but it's, it's an important one to keep in mind. Yeah, just so you're aware, we have had students who acquired the decision, thought they were going to get a certain financial package, they didn't. They then pulled out of early decision, even though they were accepted. And most schools are understanding of that as for financial reasons. So that's happened, then they've applied elsewhere and a good package went there. So you, you are binding yourself to early decision. As uh, Mike said very well, one of the nice things about early decision, if your kid really wants to go there, it's a much smaller applicant pool. So they really can get reviewed by the admissions department and, then, and the officers and go for interviews and make connections that way that may be very helpful and may lead to some financial assistance you might not get during regular application. Uh, similarly, early action is, is not binding, but it's a little bit bigger pool. So every school is different, but it is a great option. We will have a significant number of seniors again this year commit somewhere, ED, early decision, or early action, because they feel like this is the place for me, it's affordable for my family, this is where I want to go. So that, again, as he said, Mike said, that's a family decision. It's different for everybody. Uh, you mentioned the grandfather rule. How it affects, it only affects once they do it. I would counsel that it, it's better if they save it for the end, say the third or fourth year, because then it doesn't go against. Now, does it go against the students on tax income or the parents on tax income? Students. So the question is about uh, grandparent 529s and the distributions thereof. So um, it, it, on the asset side of the equation, when you're doing the application, when you're completing the application, if, if the parent is not the owner of the 529, it doesn't get included in the asset section. When the parent, if the grandparent disperses some of that money to the student, that counts as untaxed income in the year of the distribution to the student. Because of the two-year lag in the application process, if that happens junior year, it doesn't show up really anywhere. Likewise, senior year, and it's in its calendar year specific. So again, when we talk academic years, we're crossing two different calendar years. So fall, the distribution of fall is going to fall into one year, and spring is going to fall into a different year. Does that make sense? But it is considered untaxed income to the student. And of course, 529 plans can only be used for specific qualified higher education expenses, and some post-secondary expenses as well. Anybody? Anybody else? It's something that is not asked for initially on either application, but it's something that would be one of the special circumstances that I would definitely encourage you to share with the financial aid office. Um, and it's specific to student loans that the parent holds, as opposed to parent loans for their other students. So, but the payments that are required, that's not really an option to, to make or not make those payments, so that's uh, reasonable to exclude that from otherwise available income. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. You've done a great service to yourself and to your student by being here and getting some information uh, early on, so good for you. Um, again, if you've got a more personal question that you don't want to share with the whole group, I'll kind of make myself available off to the side here. But thank you very much for coming. And again, the evaluation forms, and you can just drop those at the table in the back. That'd be great. Thank you very much.